colleagues that posed with the different answer. Yes, he said. The collapse of liberalism, the collapse of the confidence, the certainties of the 19th century is the great question of our time. But the answer to it is not to reduce governments so that there remains a free and untrammeled society, but to provide security from above so that people will not, in desperation, turn to the right or to the far left in the hope of protection against the terrifying world. Keynes's response, in other words, to the question he posed in 1944, which was, how shall we provide after the war a security which will prevent a return to the pre-war conditions, was that there must be an increased role for the state. Hayek's was that there must be a reduced role for the state. Both were answering as they saw it from the very different circumstances of England and Austria, the challenge of the failure and the collapse of liberalism. Hayek, in 1945, in his classic, The Road to Serfdom, famously wrote, speaking of the Labour Party program which wanted to introduce a welfare state, and I quote, no description in general terms could give an adequate idea of the similarity to much of current English political literature to made the Labour Party program to the works which destroyed the belief in Western civilization in Germany and created the state of mind in which Nazism became successful. In other words, if the Labour Party won in 1945, Nazism would come to England. The Labour Party did win. It implemented policies very close to those which Keynes had advocated. And in England, as in much of the Western world, for the next 30 years, this debate, so to speak, was won by Keynes. Since the 1970s, we have seen the, as it were, revenge of the Austrians. But it bears consideration that in effect what we have done is live through, since the 1970s, the echo, the dim echo like a fading star of a debate conducted in the 1930s and 40s about how to defend liberalism against totalitarianism. And in the shadow of that debate, we've learned to talk public policy as neoclassical economics. And this is our problem. The welfare state, which Keynes Beveridge and many continental Europeans set up had remarkable achievements to its credit. In some countries it was social democratic. In others, like England, for example, it was really simply a set of programs to alleviate poverty. Its success lay in the remarkable reduction in inequality, if you compare the range between wealth and poverty, between rich and poor, between high incomes and low incomes, in all continental European countries, and Great Britain, and the United States, from the 1930s to the 1960s, you see a quite drastic shrinking of the gap with that shrinking of the gap went along with many other social benefits the collapse of the fear of a return 
to extreme politics, the politics of desperation, the politics of envy, the politics of insecurity and so forth. And we, the Western industrialized world, lived in a 30-year paradise, if you like, bubble, if you will, of security provisions. Now, the paradox of the welfare state and of the social democratic states of Europe was quite simply that its success undermined its support. Firstly, people forgot why they wanted these kinds of securities in the first place. The generation that remembered the 1930s, which was the generation which remained politically active through the early 70s, in all of the West was implicitly and quite often explicitly committed to preserving those institutions, those systems of taxation, those systems of social services, state provision, which would prevent a return to the remembered horrors of the 1930s. This was true, by the way, of the middle class as much as it was of poorer social classes. What social democracy in Scandinavia, the welfare states of continental Europe and the UK did for the middle class was, if anything, more strikingly effective in binding the middle class to liberal democracy than it was for the working population. Because the middle class got, by middle class I mean the European sense, professional people, people with solid, secure incomes, but not rich, they got all the welfare and social provisions that the poor got, free education, cheap or free medicine and health, insurance, protection, pensions, and so forth. But they were therefore left with a much greater disposable income since they did not have to spend their own earned income on these things beyond what they paid in tax. And so the middle class of Europe, precisely that class which had been most adrift in the 1930s, was bound closely to the post-war democratic states by the very social systems that had been introduced in theory to benefit those below them. The forgetting of these background considerations was an important part of what happened in the 70s. Since the 1970s, inequality has opened up again. The inequalities, which were diminished steadily in the West from the 1870s through the 1960s in a variety of ways, were reopened and expanded and increased. Today, the so-called Gini coefficient, which is an economic measure of the gap between rich and poor, wealth and poverty, is the same in this country as it is in China. When you consider that China is a classic case of a developing country where there is bound to be huge gaps between the wealthy few and the impoverished many, the fact that we in this country have a wealth gap approximating to that of China tells you something about how far back we have moved. More than that, take a look at the 1996 uh, law introduced and signed by Clinton, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act, the more Orwellian title I could not offer you. It's the act 
which essentially reformed welfare in this country. It should remind you all of another act passed in 1834 in England, the so-called New Poor Law. Please don't shake your heads. You all know the New Poor Law very well. The reason you know it, of course, is because in his second complete novel, Charles Dickens targeted the New Poor Law, which introduced the workhouses. Oliver Twist is about the New Poor Law. When Noah Claypole famously sneers at Oliver and calls him workers, he was doing for 1838 what we do today when we sneer at someone and say, welfare queen, welfare. What we have done after a century in which we moved from the idea that people are full members of a polity by virtue of being citizens, we've moved back to the idea that you can only be the full member of a society if you work. If you don't have work, then you are in some sense an inferior person. You are slightly less of a citizen. You are required to do certain things. You must take a job at whatever wage is available. If you don't do that, then you're not entitled to the collective support of your fellow citizens. Your entitlement comes to you only if you pay a price in what you're willing to do and how low you are willing to go. The 19th century called that least eligibility. You went into the workhouse only if you were unable to find work, even at a rock bottom wage. And for the next 100 years, 140 years, social reformers all across Europe and the States fought to get rid of this stigma. The stigma which de defined citizens by their economic position, their ranking, their opportunity for work, their lack of it, how much they earned and so forth. Rights were assigned people by virtue of their citizenship rather than as a consequence of the status they held in the economic table as it might be. We have reverted to that old system. We have reverted in this country and in England and there have been moves so far mostly unsuccessful to do so in continental Europe as well. Why we should have felt the desire to do this is unclear. Why we would wish to move from a system which we had achieved by the 60s, whereby all of our fellow citizens had equal rights, equal standing, and if they, by some misfortune, failed to find a job, failed to find a place in the economic life of the nation, they did not lose because of that. Standing presence, opportunity, rights, credibility in the social life of the nation. We've moved back, and it's interesting to ask why we've done this, why we fail to produce a language which stigmatizes this change, condemns this change as a step back into an earlier period.